Well, thanks for being here today for our uh, next episode in our pipeline webinar series, FERC Yeah. Um, we are actually coming uh, to you from a Holiday Inn Express in Springfield, Missouri. Our Springfield office uh, had a lightning strike nearby and took out our uh, router. So I have Mark Miller here with me and we're gonna try to make this work. So we're excited that you're here. Just a few um, announcements before we get started. Upcoming webinars, if you're not on our email list to receive future webinars, make sure you email me after uh, today's event and we can make sure you get on it for future ones. If you have a topic you'd like to hear us discuss, let us know. We're always interested in um, providing topics that are interesting to you. Our next one is called the Mississippi Meander, so stay tuned for more information on that. Education credit, uh, the certificate of completion is going to be emailed out this week. Um, we, we will also include a recording of the webinar in case some of your colleagues missed it and want to catch up. All of our previous webinars are also on the GeoEngineers website. Questions during today's chat. Most of us have done Zoom meetings at this point, but just in case you haven't, um, you can go to the chat icon and basically you can go down, pick my name, or you can chat to everybody uh, questions during today's event. As questions come in, um, I will uh, give a cue to Mark and ask them for our panelists. We do have a long program today, so um, as you can see, we have awesome uh, panelists and moderator. So we anticipate this program potentially going to an hour and a half. At an hour and a half, we will for sure call it. So to practice using the chat box today, because some of you might be new to it, um, if you know the answer to this question, go ahead and put it in the chat box and you can do it throughout the uh, program. And which panelists chose this song as their intro song? It's actually some French jazz, Edith Piaf, Levy, and Rose. I probably said that wrong, but that was my best attempt. So first person to answer that correctly in the chat box wins a prize and I will email you directly. So with that, I'm going to go to uh, introduce our moderator. A lot of you know him, uh, Mark Miller, Principal Geotechnical Engineer uh, based out of Springfield, Missouri, also our National Pri uh, Pipeline Practice Leader. He's worked on hundreds of projects, um, lots of HDD work. He has 25 years at GeoEngineers, 15 years with Trenchless. His song choice today, I'll give it, kind of narrow it down for you so you know you're only guessing panelists, was Above the Storm by Stick Figure. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark. We are excited that you're going to kick us off. So Excellent. Well, I'm just excited that everybody could join us. I, I'm hoping that uh, everyone who's on the call will be able to kind of gain some some understanding of kind of FERC guidance for HDD projects uh, on FERC regulated pipeline projects. Um, I was going to introduce our panelists. I think we have a pretty good set of folks uh, to discuss this topic from kind of different aspects of the industry. Um, starting off, we got Andrea Jensen. She's a geologist with the Office of Energy Pipelines from FERC. So we actually have a FERC person here to talk about their guidance document. So that would be a very valuable um, viewpoint. Uh, we have Webb Winston, who's with, uh, he's a principal engineer with Williams. We also have Rob Hutz. Uh, he's a vice president of the commercial group at Laney. Uh, they're one of the uh, largest horizontal directional drill contractors in the, in the country. So he's going to provide some insight from a, a contractor's perspective on, the, uh, on some of the guidance. We also have Amy Butler. She's a NEPA director with Perennial Environmental. So she's worked on a lot of uh, a lot of FERC regulated projects, helping those projects to get <clears throat> get through the FERC process. And then we also have Joe Dean, who's the manager of permitting with, uh, with Williams, who is uh, very experienced in, in helping to permit these, uh, these types of projects. So I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> provide a little bit of kind of background here. So I believe it was October of 2018 that uh, FERC sent out uh, some draft guidance, a little draft guidance document for uh, submittals for projects, pipeline projects that had the HDEs associated with them. And uh, so they sent that out to pipeline owners and other folks in the industry, engineering uh, firms, things like that. <clears throat> we were one of the companies that uh, was providing an opportunity to review and provide feedback on that draft document. Um, and then in the summer of 2019, Webb and I were part of a roundtable discussion at an SGA conference uh, prior to the issuance of the final final guidance document. 
And uh, we had a really good roundtable discussion. We had another person from FERC, and uh, it was kind of similar to this, but the idea behind this discussion here is now that this has been in place for uh, well over two years now, uh, let's revisit the topic. And uh, so the final guidance was issued in October of 2019. So this would be kind of a, you know, how are things going? Um, some of the things that may have been learned and just to kind of help get people who maybe are, un, un, let's say, unfamiliar with the guidance or don't even know it exists, kind of provide that, present, kind of present this to, to those people. So anyway, uh, I'm going to start with Andre. We're just going to go around, ask questions. This will be an open discussion. And uh, so I'm going to start with Andrea to just kind of provide us with kind of a, I guess a short overview of the guidelines, kind of the intent of the guidelines from, from Burke's perspective. So go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have to start by saying that as a member of the commission staff, uh, the views expressed here are my own and not necessarily those of the commission or of any individual commissioner. Um, so our guidance document was intended to help industry professionals improve the quality and consistency of their HDD plans um, and increase the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of our environmental review, um, reducing the need for, data, for supplemental data requests to you guys. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, elements that should be included in these plans was transparent to reduce the need for data request questions. Um, and to encourage industry to consolidate elements in one place. Um, previously, they were all fairly scattered throughout the application, resource report two, resource report six, resource report one. So just trying to get those consolidated was a big goal for us. Um, and also to encourage the inclusions of measures to improve monitoring, document reten retention, um, as well as kind of thinking about timing and readiness of IR response, um, encourage some pre-planning, for response to releases um, in different situations, as well as to consider who would be notified of when. So um, a lot of different elements kind of coming together um, and our intentions here. Because I think what, one of the big things was that, you know, when people were trying to permit a project, <clears throat> there was often a lot of times a lot of information that was lacking in their submittal. And you kind of, I guess the guidelines is to kind of help provide a, a framework so that you can get yeah, muted there, Mark. It should be good now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. For some reason I was muted. Uh, so Andrea, sorry about that. Um, so it, it seems as though the, the guidance was to, one of the things that you're trying to do is you're trying to get when people provide you and submit stuff to you, you want kind of a more consistent package um, so that, you know, you're, you're seeing some of the, you're getting the data that you're going to want to see anyway, even though it's not necessarily required by FERC requirements, you're still going to ask to make sure that these, you know, people submitting these things are kind of doing their homework. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. It also gives us some place um, so that we don't have to keep sending out the same long list of data request questions. We can just point to the one document and say, hey, look here for additional reference. Um, so it makes it, I think, a little easier and more transparent for everyone. So uh, I guess Amy or Joe, you kind of are the, on the kind of regulatory side of things and, and helping to get these projects permitted. Um, <clears throat> you know, how do you, you know, I guess, have the data requests changed or, you know, since the implementation of the guidelines or how do you see the guidelines impacting um, the data requests that you, you do get back or will get back? So I would say that the main difference we're seeing is not so much that we aren't getting any data requests regarding HDDs, but more so that we've limited the type of data requests and the number of times we're having to go back with FERC on it. So previously, if we weren't providing all of the information that FERC needed, you got a data request saying, provide this information. And then once you provided it, you may have gotten a follow-up data request asking for clarification on some of the information you provided. Uh, this has kind of removed some of that. So we can hopefully minimize and then streamline the data request process with FERC and limit those number of multiple data requests. Try and make sure that since we know what FERC is looking for and they've provided this guidance, we have a clear outline on what's what's expected and then the only data request we have is clarification that FERC may have on what we've provided. So basically, you, 
you may go from you know typically four data requests to let's say you could maybe cut that down to two data requests. Is that fair to say? And just throwing some numbers out there. Sure. I mean, like with everything, right? It's the how thoroughly you answer the questions the first time FERC asks, asks it, and then if the information you provide raises more questions, certainly that, and it, it would definitely be a case by case basis. But it does eliminate that need for that first step. That was uh, kind of a fairly frequent, I think Andrea can agree, data request that we were getting of provide all the standard information and then we'll ask you questions about what your plan is. So now we can get that plan done at first. And to me, it seems like, um, you know, it could really save a lot of time because what's in the guidance, if you provide that, if you did not provide what's in the guidance document, then, you know, responding to that data request could take a lot of time and effort. Whereas if you do this stuff in advance, you, you basically comply with what the guidance document is asking for. It, it seems to me like your data requests would be easier and more quickly, um, you know, replied to, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Joe, I didn't know if you wanted to, to jump in there and add anything either based on your industry side experience. No, I agree with what you said. You know, we were getting asked for a lot of the stuff that's required in the new guidance anyway. And so we had actually started just providing it up front, knowing what FERC was expecting. But it's so it's nice now to have a sort of a checklist of all the information that they need. And then, like you said, you can sort of jump to the uh, more specific questions or clarifications about that information. So I haven't really seen an increase in the number of data requests as a result of this guidance. Um, but the data requests are usually, you know, narrower in scope or more specific about the technical details of the information you provided. Okay. Right on. Um, I guess this one's for you, Andrea. Um, you know, one of the questions I know some people have had in the past is, you know, are HDD and direct pipe installations treated similarly during the review process? Um, even though the, the guidance document is for HDD, I guess, should people use it also for uh, direct pipe because it is a trenchless methodology. It uses uh, a lubricant that is similar to drilling fluid, if not the same. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the intention was to that the uh, guidance document would also be applicable or should be reviewed for direct pipe installations. Um, I think we find an HGD as any trenchless process that uses drilling fluids under pressure. And certainly direct pipe uses Drilling fluids and they're under much less pressure pressure than HDD, but the intent was for it to still be um, usable for direct pipe as well. So we we do look for this for similar information for direct pipe and HDD. Um, we would be looking for an inadvertent return and monitoring response for both methods, um, even though we understand that the risk of an IR is much lower lower with direct pipe compared to HDD. Um, we are still looking for geotechnical information. Um, we don't see too many direct pipe pro crossings proposed and we haven't overseen very many through construction. Um, so I do expect that to potentially change in the future um, as far as our information needs for reviewing those. Um, but for the time being, we, we do treat them fairly similarly. Right on. Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, this is kind of, you know, kind of open question to all, but I'll, I guess I'll start with you, Andrea, about you know, how should an applicant really handle the, the potential for a change in construction methodology? You know, let's say that um, you intend to install an HED across some obstacle, be it a river or wetland or some other some other feature. You know, some some point during the, the process, you know, maybe maybe it's determined that really an HDD is not a feasible option or the, the risk of a, of a trying to complete an HDD is. Is, is higher than, you know, too high, you know, just the project team's not willing to take the risk. You know, what, what's a good process or, you know, can, can any, anybody on the call, you know, kind of discuss how to handle that change in, in construction methodology is after you kind of started the process. Yeah, so this is always gonna be a variance under condition one, which says that you must adhere to the construction procedures and mitigation measures described in your applicant in your application and supplements. Um, under condition one, you also have to prove that whatever your modification is, it's going to have equal or less environmental impact. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Um, 
So if you're changing from a cro uh, trenched crossing or an open cut to a trenchless crossing, um, we would be looking for information such as the source and volume of drilling fluid, um, of water for drilling fluid, um, proposed additives. We would be looking for the geotechnical assessment um, if the circumstances are correct, if it's gonna be a longer than 500 foot crossing, if it's gonna be deeper than the trenched crossing would have been, um, and if it's crossing um, sensitive features. So there's some, some you know, general rule of thumb things where we would be looking for the geotechnical assessment. Otherwise we would be looking for justification as to why you would not be completing a geotechnical assessment. Um, we would also be looking for you to provide an HDD plan and profile, which would identify the entry and exit points, um, the length, um, that sort of things, updated noise assessments. Um, so there's some additional information that you would provide if you're changing from a trench to, to a trenchless. Um, it's slightly more difficult to change from a trenchless to a trenched crossing because again, you have to provide or you have to show that the modification would have equal or less environmental impact. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we highly encourage all of that geotechnical work to be done up front. Um, the feasibility assessment to be as complete as possible um, so that you don't run into those problems um, because ultimately if we can't approve that as a variance that may end up being an amendment. Um, so that's some of my thoughts basically, on that one. <laughs> basically make that determination as early as possible in, in the process. Is what you're saying. <clears throat> Hey Webb, I got a question for you. Um, so, from from Williams' perspective, you know what? To what extent is you know Williams kind of changed the amount of due diligence for for trenchless installations that you guys have as part of your projects? I mean, that you had to look at the guidelines and say, okay, well now we need to do we need to make sure we're doing this where we weren't doing it before, things like that. Yeah, Mark, not a lot. Um, kind of a lot of the points Andrea mentioned, I think it it really just kind of steered us more in a direction to really be thinking through the planning phase and really thinking through um, how we're going to execute these crossings and really getting into the nitty gritty details of fully where maybe in the past you're just kind of going through the motions. But when FERC specifically spelled this out in their guidance document, I think it really make, let our whole team kind of take a step back and say, hey, let's go through this and let's understand really what they're asking for. And I would say probably the biggest change was that we were trying to uh, then start developing this plan as as FERC laid out in their guidance. And, and Andrea mentioned it and I was kind of thinking and laughing about it is, you know, we're, we used to just kind of throw HDD and resource report one, two, 10, HD, you know, core sample, geotechnical here, HDD profile here, and it was just kind of all over the place. And what the HDD plan kind of did was it, it, it pushed to consolidate all that material into uh, this this single document and and include that it it really was kind of difficult at first to kind of start thinking through how are we going to do this it's a little different but once we kind of got that template together and started thinking through what that looks like it's really made it a lot easier and i hope it's made it easier for FERC to review the information because it's definitely made it easier for us to kind of have that one-stop shop to all things hdd are going to be in here um so that's probably the biggest change, Mark, but we're kind of over that hurdle now. So um, it, it's kind of getting easier now. So I don't know if that was the intent, but it's kind of it's kind of good right now. Well, easy is easy is good. Amy, Joe, anything to add to that? From the regulatory side, permitting side? Um, no, not really, other than I 100% I agree with Webb that it definitely consolidated and made it streamlined so that FERC could actually see where we were putting that information and not having to hunt for it because it didn't fit squarely within any of the resource reports. Um, it very much depended on the resource that you were crossing or or the impacts that were potentially of being avoided or, or in, created by the crossing. Gotcha. <clears throat> so... Amy or Joe, I guess there's another one. So, you know, Andrea mentioned, you know, if, you're, if you need to change your, your construction methodology, um, it can be difficult to go from, let's say, a, a, a trenchless crossing to an open cut at some point in the process. So when we talked about trying to do that initial upfront feasibility as, as soon as possible so you can rule out a tr potential trenchless in installation if it, if it is deemed too risky, you know, construction risk is just too high. 
you know, potential impacts because of those risks, risks are high. So, you know, if you have a project that's planning more than one HD, you know, what, what recommendations do you have regarding the timing of the site investigation for feasibility and design? Because I know that sometimes you, you can't, you can't always get access to the, to the locations as early as you would like. And so, you know, I know in some of the projects we've done, you know, we've, We've only been acting able to access to certain properties, drill some of the, you know, some of the borings to understand the subsurface conditions, but you know, there's gaps in it, you know, and substantial gaps to the point where you might not be able to make a feasibility decision or you know determination uh, without all that data. So, you know, kind of what kind of recommendations did you have if you, if you can't get all that stuff right away? <clears throat> well, you know, you obviously need to prioritize doing the feasibility for a trenchless crossing as early as possible. Um, if you're not able to get that information and, and you think there's a risk that you may have to switch to a, a, a more conventional trenched crossing, um, what we would, what I would recommend is, you know, identifying that as a contingency and having a plan in place and providing FERC with all the information it would need to evaluate the impacts of that type of crossing in its environmental document and sort of clearly outlining the, the triggers that would cause you to switch from one method to another. So that makes the uh, approval process a little bit easier on the back end. Um, not sure if that answers your question, but... That's what I would recommend. Yeah, yeah. It's just sometimes you, know, you I don't know. So I, I know in some cases we've had to wait months to go out and, and get the last of our subsurface information. So, um, you know, in, in a lot of cases maybe that's not a problem, but in some cases, you know, that that could be the determining factor whether or not you know you just, you, know, you, you det determine that the crossing is feasible or not. So. And I, I would just add to that, that it's certainly a, a issue if you can't get it. And it's just one of those things like kind of Joe mentioned, there's a contingency plan that has to be worked into your, your design if that's the case. And your best bet to protect yourself with FERC so that you're not delaying as much as you would be if you hadn't considered an alternative crossing method is to present it as much as you can on the, on the forefront. And I'd be interested if Andrea has um, any guidance and stuff on too, is that if you can't get access to those sites until you have your order because of condemnation or whatever. If that would be um, something that FERC would work into a condition and if the project would still move forward and the authorization would still move forward if you were missing that piece for one of the crossings, say. Yeah, so obviously we strongly recommend completing geotechnical investigations prior to uh, application submittal or during the NEPA process. Um, especially where the drill or the subsurface geology is expected to be more complex. Um, in areas such as the Gulf Coast, um, we can reasonably conclude that the HDD has a high likelihood of success without seeing the geotech. You're probably still gonna see that condition um, because obviously collecting geotechnical investigation information is important um, to plan your drilling fluids program and to really make sure that the drill is designed well. Um, but in terms of feasibility and somewhere like the Gulf Coast, you, you're probably still going to be able to, to successfully complete that drill. Um, but in other areas where it's glaciated in the north or the northeast, for example, um, without the geotech, it's a lot harder to make the case that uh, the HDD is, the, is a feasible crossing method. It's the, the best idea. Um, so I think there are ways to present that. Um, for example, with uh, publicly available information, with geologic maps, with any uh, with water well information, for example, maybe you can kind of provide some sort of justification that way. But yeah, certainly having a contingency plan is um, is a good way to think about that ahead of time in case those changes need to be made. Um, you've already kind of run this through us, and you have that plan in place already. It's going to be easier for us to, to make that modification. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, Rob, I got a question for you. Um, just kind of change gears a little bit. <clears throat> so the guidelines they uh, recommend annual pressure monitoring, and uh, you know basically, can you, I guess those who don't have the background, could you describe kind of what that is and 
is that a burden uh, for the contractor? You know, does it increase risks associated with the project? So, you know, from a construction standpoint, that sort of thing. Sure. So the, the annular pressure tool is, is essentially just an add-on to the downhole tooling that you're using for guidance system, whether that's a gyroscopic tool or pair track, true tractor, some of the, the tools, even walkover system. Essentially, there's a, a probe uh, module that goes on the back side of the probe that uh, has the transducers. You can monitor internal pipe pressure, external annular pressure with the tool. So as far as, as a burden, it, it runs off the same wire as your steering tool, assuming you're using a, a wired tool or, or communicating to the walkover system. Doesn't really create any additional work there. As you mentioned, it's the requirement is for monitoring. And, and the important part to, to note about that is if you, if you just monitor it and you don't use it for anything, it, it doesn't do anybody any good. It's got to be compared to what your expectations are, run those analysis, the evaluations that, that you guys do to say, this is what the pressure should be. This is what the soil can withstand. So we have something to compare that, that to. Otherwise, it's not really a useful tool to us. But as far as using it, no, it's, it's not a it's not a burden. It's it's a great tool when when you use it correctly, and you're not just watching the numbers go up and down to to help you know about what's going on down hole, or or your drilling fluid properties correct, or you clean the hole adequately. So I think it's it's a benefit to the contractor more than it could possibly be any hindrance, in my opinion, to have that tool and to use it effectively to complete crossings. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and one thing too, you know, this is annular pressure monitoring. You know, this is actual down hole pressures. This is you know the pressure. But the drilling fluid is actually applying to the formation. So uh, it's not the pressure you might see at the pump. But um, you know, it's a good point, Rob. You know, and you know, having having let's say the some estimated pressures that you should expect based on you know the size of the hole, size of drill pipe, drilling fluid weight. Um, you know, it's I, I think that in a lot of cases it, it's not too difficult to determine with a reasonable amount of accuracy what those pressures should be and and you know i think you're right you know just watching the pressures is, is not sufficient it's it's looking at the pressures understanding how 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 well they, your your actual pressures are aligning with what you expect and you know if you do see issues where your pressures begin to get in excess of what you expect, well then, you know, maybe then you, you need to implement some sort of action to kind of help get those pressures back down where you expect them. Um, I don't know, does that sound fair, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're exactly right in what you're saying there. It's a tool that can be very useful for the contractor to, to minimize issues, to prevent the likelihood of in returns and, and to to use that effectively to, to help successfully install the crossings without creating those issues. But again, you, you have to use it, you have to know what it is, what it isn't, what you're trying to achieve by, by having that tool. And as you said, if you're just watching the numbers, then yeah, an annual pressure tool does nothing in of itself to, to make a crossing success, successful unless you use it the way it's supposed to be used. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, let me see here. Actually, we know, I mean, we're talking to you, Rob, so it, let's go with another question. Um, you know, one of the things that Burke kind of outlines in the guidelines is uh, it mentions the use of NSF 60 compliant additives. Um, you know, kind of, can you tell us, at least based on, I know you're not a mud engineer, but, you know, from your understanding, kind of what's the state of the NSF 60 certification for drilling fluid products? And, you know, are, are a lot of products uh, in use today, are they NF60 compliant? So it's a relatively an, an easy thing to, you know, use those or are they harder to find or what's the, what's the state of that? Yeah, so certainly echoing your disclaimer that I'm not a mud engineer or, or uh, otherwise <laughs> all that educated in the drilling fluid and, and additive world. But the NSF60 uh, certification, as, as most folks know, is essentially built around water, drinking water standards and, and used a lot in water well uh, drilling. So the the interesting thing that I found out about the NSF 60 process is it's it's basically each individual supplier or manufacturer has to get their the trade name certified. So if you have two types of, of bentonite, or there's hundreds of kinds of bentonites out there, you have to get the the individual that that you want to use or that they're trying to sell that that supplier has has to get that certified. So it's not just bentonite in general or pack or soda ash in general, it's these individual labels. So for us, 
and and over the years they've become a lot more uh, prevalent that the, the various manufacturers and suppliers have gone out and got the process gone through the process got their certifications on it but there could very well be a, a similar product that is the exact same chemical composition as product A, but product B didn't go through the, the certification process, so we can't use product B. And as of itself, we could always just shift over and use product A. Maybe there's a pricing, maybe there's a supply issue or something like that, which isn't too significant. We can usually overcome that. Where it can create a little bit more of a problem for the guys in the field is even though they're they're all the same product, some folks, they may get used to a particular name of a product and they understand that this trade name of the product, they know what it does, when to use it, how to use it. When you give them a different type of product, even though it's the same thing, they can get a little bit confused sometimes and, and you have to make sure that they understand what they're doing because you've presented them with something else, say the mud technician, presented them with a new product that they are not familiar with, although it's the same thing, but you have to make sure that they, they understand what it is, when to use it, how to use it, and, and don't create issues in the field. Uh, so, but as far as generally being able to to get crossings completed and to use NSF 60 products, generally not not a, a huge detriment. There are some times where there's some products out there that that aren't NSF 60 certified that sometimes we would really like to be able to use and and we can't, and and so that does occasionally create some issues with some various things. You can't use anything with. Uh, with a lot of organics, you know, a lot of times anthem gum, stuff like that is, is not approved to be used because if it sat in a water well, it would essentially rot and create issues for, for drinking water. For us, it wouldn't really do anything inside of the annular space of a hole, but it's, it's not approved to be used, so it can't be used. So there's little issues like that that can create some, uh, some headaches from time to time, but Generally speaking, it, it's not something that can't be overcome. It can just make things a little more challenging from time to time and, and have to approach a project a little bit differently than if, if we're not held to the NSF 60 requirement. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that we do recommend um, that additives are certified to NSF 60, um, but it's not, it's not required. Um, it is a standard, though, that I know that states are using, so states might be requiring it. But as far as FERC's concerned, um, because it is a standard for direct and indirect drinking water additives, it's not perfect for our purpose. It doesn't take into account aquatic or environmental toxicity. Um, and also natural polymers and modified natural polymers are not approved for use or remediation under this standard is, is, is what the standard says. Um, so I believe that does include things like cornstarch, guar gum, and probably xanthan gum. Um, what's more important for us is um, the safety data sheets. Um, so we ask that you all you submit the safety data sheets. We do review each of those individually, um, and we look for any other uh, factors. If the product composition isn't specified, that's kind of a big red flag. If it, we, we look at the ecotoxicity information, um, and we're not toxicologists, but we kind of use our best judgment looking at the numbers um, as to if this has the potential to cause you know significant adverse impacts um, if it were to spill or if there were to be an inadvertent release to to the environment. Um, so again. Uh, NSF NC60 is, is a good standard. It's just some, it's something to point at. It's because otherwise we would be having to review a lot more going through the safety data sheets. Um, so, so it's kind of a good, like if, if it's NSF NC60 certified, that it's a good initial first step to look at. Um, makes it a little easier for review. Um, but we do look at all the safety data sheets and, and kind of use our best judgment there. Um, we do what we can. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just add, Mark, to Andrea's point, you know, we've had a lot of success submitting additives and drilling fluid products that are not on that list. And if they are deemed environmentally innocuous, I think it's the term that's used, you know, it's fine. It's just an extra step, right, that once we get a contractor on board and we're turning that stuff in, you know, I've caught myself thinking, you know, kind of about it differently recently, you know, because to Rob's point, and I'll do the same disclaimer, Rob, you just did, I'm not a mud engineer, I'm not a, not a mud salesman, so I'm going to stay out of that world. But, you know, I oftentimes thought there's a lot of these products that um, are very similar to the products that are already on the list. And I kind of wondered, you know, what if these drilling fluid suppliers kind of took note of this, you know, it's not 
it's just an extra stamp of approval, right? Once it's on the NSF NC60 list, it kind of opens up the opportunities for these products to be used. And I oftentimes thought, well, what if these drilling fluid suppliers realized that and just took their product and got and got it certified since it probably would be, I don't know what that process looks like or what it costs. And maybe it's a business decision they don't want to go towards, but um, I think that would really help the industry and probably help them because they're getting that stamp of approval on their product. But just a thought I had as you were as you all were talking. But. Yeah, I know it's one of the one of the things that's kind of been a bit of a an issue in the past is you know you're supposed to submit safety data sheets for the materials you're going to use, but when you're submitting this stuff initially, you don't have a contractor on board, and you, you know you you want to wait until you have a contractor under contract to do the work to then provide you with those safety data sheets, and so. You know, I, I guess, I guess is essentially just kind of working with the contractor to try to the extent possible use those NSF 60 products. And then for those that maybe they do want to use, uh, run those additional products through, you know, back through FERC, basically. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, just to clarify, we don't expect, um, we know that, that exact products probably aren't going to be known until the contractor is, is hired. So we understand that that's not going to come with application submittal, um, but we would expect to see it with the implementation plan. Um, and we usually look for a commitment with the application that any, um, any additives are going to be non-petrochemical, non-toxic, and um, comply with environmental permits, I think is the word is the wording that's used in the guidance. Um, so we'll look for that commitment ahead of time. Oh, and and the commitment that the uh, safety data sheets will be filed um, once once that list is known. Um, but but yeah, we understand that the safety data sheets and the exact list of products probably aren't going to be known until the implementation plan is filed. And actually, you know, uh, Andrea, since you're up there and, and you know, we can kind of open this up to everybody. Uh, Recent project, you know, we were chatting about how to delineate workspaces for the uh, surface tracking wire that's uh, often used. Uh, well, it's used with a couple of the uh, the pilot hole survey systems, and oh, uh, maybe I'll get with Rob to, to kind of just you know kind of describe the 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 tracking wire, what's needed to to lay the tracking wire down, because I guess. You know, the question that came is, we don't know exactly where the contractor is going to put this thing during construction. So, you know, uh, when we come up with our drawings, how do we delineate that workspace so that it doesn't look like our, our limits of disturbance? Like we're going to do all this disturbance over a large area when in reality it's not. So, Rob, you want to first start with just kind of describing the tracking wire, what's needed from the contractor's perspective? Yeah, sure. So, the, the, Surface secondary coil that we're referring to is used with a couple of the systems, namely the, the Paratrack system vector tool and the tensor, the, the true tacker tools is, is primarily where you'll see that you don't necessarily need it with the gyros and the, the walkovers, obviously, but depending on the which manufacturer of tool you're using and which model or make of that tool that you're using can depend on on where you want to lay that coil. There's there's a lot, there's some rules of thumb that generally you need your coil to be as wide as you are deep or, or twice as wide, just depending on interference, other issues, things of that nature. You may be able to run a, a coil down the center line and a return down the right or left, right or left of the crossing. Other tools, you, you kind of need that loop on either side and, and not one down the middle. Sometimes you can run a, a single coil down the middle and not have a return. Sometimes you can put your coil way off to the side, sort of depends on What's what the ground conditions are, what other interference might be out there, where you have access to the different uh, the surface features that may be along there, but but certainly that's something that uh, obviously the, the engineer and owner may not know that until the contractor comes on board and has a chance to go out there and, and see that one to know which tool they're going to use and and then getting out there to actually try it and see how things look. It may may have to modify, so certainly that can be a difficult one to uh, to to dictate where where it needs to be or where it's going to be the wire itself is you know maybe a, a 10 gauge 12 gauge wire 8 gauge depending on on the the location and the depth and the length and all that stuff and it's it's just you know an insulated copper wire that runs along the surface uh, and, you know, we, we run our our electricity through it create a magnetic field locate the probe 
locates itself with inside there. There's some coils, you know, usually a little survey hub or something that we'll put down there to survey in. So very minimal disturbance wise, but when you see it on a drawing, a coil layout, it looks like a, a massive workspace between entry and exit. So it, it, I'm sure it could throw some red flags for, uh, for different agencies doing reviews. Yeah, so ba basically you're, you're basically saying that there's really no way to know ahead of time where exactly that thing's gonna be. So, you know, I know on some projects in the past um, uh, that I'm not sure that there was ever, FERC projects even, I can't say that there was ever any workspace delineated for installing that wire. And, uh, you know, so I guess at the end of the day was was not done correctly. So <clears throat> I don't know, Amy, you're, What's that? Very infrequent that we'll see when, when we go to bid a project that we'll see that any workspace has been delineated or, or that a coil wire has even been considered in, in the uh, drawings that we see. Uh, it's, it's certainly not that not prevalent. You may just see that you know, a note on the drawing that says hand clearing is allowed between entry and exit or no hand clearing or no, no equipment, things like that is really all we would ever see. All right. So uh, Amy or Andrea, any, any uh, kind of guidance on how, how maybe best to show that, uh, you know, show a workspace that uh, could be used during construction to lay this wire out, but also at the same time, you know, not necessarily intent, the intent to be, we're going to clear this entire area. Yeah, so uh, one of the main benefits of a trenchless crossing is that it minimizes surface disturbance between the entry and exit points. So obviously, if we see a bunch of workspace between the entry and exit points without further justification, um, you're going to get a data request question. Um, so I think it's just the most important thing is just to show, to, to make sure it's clear what's happening there. Um, so you can maybe delineate that workspace and just show you know, it, it show the show the possible workspace on the on the alignment sheet, and then specify that you know while this looks like it's a large workspace, while it's you know x acres of workspace is shown, um, only x acres is actually going to be disturbed for the placement of guide wire between the entry and exit points. Um, it would be a hand cleared path no greater than x feet, um, x feet wide, and um, it's going to be a total of however however much disturbance. Um, so. Even though that workspace is shown, you've made this commitment um, to minimize the disturbance in that manner. Um, so that even if we do go out there on an inspection during construction and the whole workspace is cleared, that would still be a violation under condition one, um, even though it is a certificated workspace. So I think it's just clear to, to make sure to let us know what's gonna happen, even if you don't know exactly where it's gonna happen. And if, if there's any sensitive features that might be disturbed, obviously describe like there's a cultural resources site, maybe try to avoid that, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah, sure. Just make sure that any of those are also identified and described there. Um, and yeah, that workspace should all be um, surveyed for environmental and cultural resources. Yeah. We, we have done that in the past where we designate a special workspace that has certain restrictions on it, foot traffic, hand clearing, no earth disturbance, those kinds of things. Uh, either in advance or we've planned for it and gotten all the clearances and everything necessary to do it as a, as a variance in the field once you got the contractor on board and know, have a better idea of where those wires are going to be. I guess it, it's, a, it's, a, I guess it's a good example of having, let's say, good communications with the FERC person that you're working with because you could you know, tell them ahead of time how you're going to handle depicting that on your submittals, right? You say, okay, this is how we like to do it so that when they get it, you know, they're not sitting there thinking, well, yeah, what are, what are these people thinking? They don't need all this area, you know? So, you know, preparing the, the per person ahead of time of what you're, you're trying to accomplish, I think would probably go a long ways into kind of smoothing the process out. <clears throat> yeah, I was just thinking about Joe's point, you know, um, I was trying to think through how have we handled that in the past when it wasn't laid out on the drawing and then we, and we got into construction and hey we need to go this wide to all the points rob brought up about the the width you know relative to the depth of the drill and then you you think through okay well how many different landowners are there or are there problematic landowners in between here and there you know because now we're going pretty wide if you're in a residential area you may be hitting a lot of different landowners and then when you're going through that process of the variance in order to get that approved if you think about the time that we're talking about laying a coal wire, we're ready to start drilling, right? So it's like now you're 
it's our fault, right? We're holding up construction because now we need to be out there. And how amenable is that landowner now? Is there any kind of condemnation that went into that process? Is there any contentious ones that now this may not be a good time to be having that conversation? So um, I think this is a really good topic because it's not something we think about. And and sometimes we just lay out the the 50 foot corridor and then we force our contractor into just fitting the wire in that narrow space. Now we're sacrificing quality and accuracy of the survey of the pilot hole, right? So it, I think this is a good topic for the industry to get out in front of. And I, I appreciate, you know, the, you know, ways to kind of delineate it without raising too many red flags and making it something that is uh, a problem. So. Uh -huh. We'll say just one thing that getting out in front of the, the FERC team and, and notifying them can be a challenge. Often we don't have necessarily a PM identified at FERC until the application is submitted, even if you do a pre-app kind of meeting with FERC. Um, and then once you're in application submitted, you have ex parte rules and we can't um, communicate kind of on a on a casual basis with them. So I think conversations like this and, and kind of getting that um, message out there is it's really effective since we can't always just have a quick phone call with the PM. April? Any, yeah, any... do you like the shadow happening here? It's like really great. Um, questions? No questions right now, but I will just encourage folks to ask questions. Like this is pretty remarkable that we have all of these people on the line. Like awesome, awesome. So thank you um, in advance for any questions you have. Also, just to break it up, Amy loves French jazz. So that is your fun fact for the day. Um, Jeremy from Bureau of Rec won a special little geo treat that we'll get in the mail. But yeah, let us know if you have questions. Just put them in the chat and we will get them answered. Thanks okay. for letting me interrupt for a minute. No problem. Bye. Um, so uh, actually, you know, going, you know, kind of in that same direction, you know, talking about accessing areas during construction, you know, one of the things is, you know, now with the guidance, you know, there's requirements for monitoring of uh, the, the alignment for inadvertent returns. Um, how do you handle it if, uh, you know, inadvertent return occurs, but it's outside of your kind of permitted area? Um, you know, you, you obviously need to have access to that to go in and clean it up, to do whatever you need to do to restore it. And so what's a how do you handle landowner and agency permissions when that something like that happens? I guess that's maybe um, maybe question for Web. I guess it's, you know we could start there and maybe go around. Yeah, we don't have IRs, so I'd have to give it to somebody uh, else. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good job. No, actually, um, that's a really good question, and. Uh, my phone a friend is Joe Dean, and I actually see that he is online. So, uh, you know, when I think about it, it, one thing I read about in the FERC guidance is, is, you know, again, back to that planning, think about it, right? And a lot of times when we go into these drills, we're, we're, we're kind of identifying through our hydraulic fracture and inadvertent returns analysis, um, where those high risk locations are, or based on the topography or based on the subsurface formation, where are those high risk areas? And kind of think about, hey, <laughs> right here is a spot where we might need to go down and clean this up. We're not planning on it happening, but we know that there's a risk. And so if you can kind of get out in front of it and somewhat plan for that risk and how would you get in there and come talk about it with your contractor, I think it's pretty important that I picked up for the FERC guidance or from the FERC guidance on, on what, what to do there. Again, focusing in on the planning part, but Joe, I know there's a variance and there's some different things like that, but I'm gonna have to, phone phone you my friend about all those details yeah uh, most of the time i would say you can't really plan for where the ir happens right if you if you could then you could maybe plan the workspace and permit some contingency area or something like that but what i found is when that happens in the field most uh people landowners agencies um are pretty willing to help you get it cleaned up. And so there's a way to expedite that process because I think it's in everyone's best interest to address the IR and get it cleaned up and get everything back to as close to normal as possible. And so I, unfortunately, 
Uh, you just need to have a, a, a flexible plan in place that you can uh, implement um, when or wherever that happens. And, you know, it'll vary by state or by what agency you're dealing with, what, whether it's federal land or private property, all, all those kinds of things are different. So uh, I don't really have a great answer for that. I don't know if Amy or Andrea do, uh, do but. Thanks, yeah, we, we definitely encourage pre-planning, um, looking at uh, the topography, as, as what I mentioned, um, know what you're going to do and have in your, in your IR plan what you're going to do if anything happens in an accessible area. Um, if you know that you have problem landowners um, or if you have residential, if you're just in an, a residential area, you know, talk to them ahead of time, say, hey, there's, there's, a, there's a chance that there's a release, I might need to go out access your property and you know make make nice nice with the landowners ahead of time um if you're in an area where there are basements that's another thing where you might reach out to them be like hey if you see anything in your basement <laughs> then let us know um so that you can you can kind of get ahead of that so that's kind of where the, the pre-planning comes in and obviously you you, you can't pre-plan for where it might happen but just to consider any of these scenarios um generally if there is an ir and you need to clean it up with um, hand tools and hand traffic, foot traffic. Um, if it's outside of the certificated workspace, I, that's usually not an issue, I believe. Um, any variances, obviously getting getting that contained and under control is kind of the, the first priority. Um, so we can, I, I would just recommend getting in contact with your project manager as soon as that happens and to kind of figure out where to go from there and you know making sure that that's all in your in your IR plan what what, what you're going to do if and where it happens. Mark I have a question for that came in uh Shauna uh great job asking a question first question love this girlfriend back on the HDD plan I've seen the plan placed in various IR, RRs resource guess, reports resource reports as long as it's consistently referred to in the appropriate uh, RRs doesn't matter which RR appendix it is in, and does FERC have a preference? Andrea, girl, no. I think that's you. Yeah, <laughs> as long as we can find it, that's fine. Uh, and and again, it's easiest if you know everything's together. Um, I, I've seen it where the the HDD plans in like resource report one, and then all the geotechs in resource report six. So I mean, as long as we can find it, it's fine. But it's it's easier when I'm scrolling through it if you know all the all the HDD stuff is all together in one place. Excellent. Hopefully that answers Sean's question. She said, thanks. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna go back to Rob here. Um, you know, cause one of the things that um, is really stressed in the, in the guidance document is that um, really stressing the monitoring and the alignment, you know, uh, it, there's been a number of pretty significant frack outs on some projects that uh, basically are say allowed to get huge because the monitoring apparently wasn't being done. If it was being done, uh, they weren't monitoring the entire alignment. And even if they were monitoring the entire alignment, uh, it was never documented that it was done. And so now, you know, now there's some guidance on the actual monitoring and, and Rob, I mean, from a construction standpoint, I mean, you know, from the monitoring and documentation standpoint, you know, is that something that, you know, in your experience is typically done, not done, sporadic, um, does it impact the construction process at all? I get to that in just one second, Mark, but I was just thinking about the, the previous topic there. I, I was curious okay. how it's, as the guy that shows up last, how, how those conversations go when, uh, the owner engineer permitting shows up and tells people to look in their basement while we're out there drilling. I imagine that throws a wrench in the, uh, in the acceptance. That's probably why they don't like us by the time we show up. Yeah, no, I hear you. But uh, yeah, about about your question there. So the the monitoring side, of course, there's there's the physical viewing and walking the alignment that you, that you mentioned there. And then we we'll also can talk about the tools that we have that we referred to earlier with the, the annular pressure monitoring, with monitoring delivering returns at the either the entry or the exit bit, watching fluid volumes in our tanks, understanding what what hole we're creating, what volume we're creating, and what we're doing with all the, the fluids there so that we before we know that there may be an issue downhole, we're already using everything we can on the surface 
at our disposal to to monitor fluid volume so that we can have a good feeling that that we're getting the majority or everything back to to the surface at at the entry or exit location. We do have the requirement there for the the walking of the alignment, and and as you say, that generally that's somebody walking back and forth along the center line. When you do maybe either it's a requirement or or you have an indication that potentially there's some fluid loss going on. Obviously, just fluid loss doesn't mean that it's coming to the surface necessarily, but it's a potential that it could be. And I think we've probably all seen too where where we've we recognize that there may be a, a little bit of fluid loss. We're walking the alignment. Maybe we shut down for a while. We've done some different things, manipulated fluid and whatnot. And then an inadvertent return comes up 500, 1,000 feet off the center line. So obviously, we're not going to be looking 1,000 feet off the center line the entire length of the, the alignment. But but maybe we go back to the, the topography or the subsurface conditions and return analysis. And, and that gives us a little bit of an indication of where we should be looking or, or maybe where a higher probability of fluid could be coming if we're losing it. But as far as the, the monitoring in, of, in and of itself, maybe it's an extra person that we have to put on the crew if, if we're dedicating somebody full-time to, to walk in the alignment and, and looking for things or, or maybe a couple people like that. But assuming that we as a contractor know the requirements before we we plan the job before we show up there's really not any any adverse impacts to us it's just a matter of using that as as one of the many tools we have to to ensure that we have the the returns coming where we want them to maybe maybe a misconception or maybe not you know i think there's a a lot of a lot of uh experience and would show in a lot of people that may think that the contractor doesn't necessarily care and we're just out there blowing and if mud comes up somewhere, well, guess who has to clean it up? It, it's us that has to clean it up if we create an issue. It's us, it's downtime, it's at our risk. It's, it's, it's all those, those things are not, not good for us. So certainly not in our best interest to, to not be using those tools to create those issues and, and to allow those things to happen. It's bad for us as a contract, we're likely to lose money on that particular project. There's reputational damage. And then to the industry as well, those, some of those major instances that you referred to mark those those certainly created issues for everyone uh, moving forward after after some of those events that we had to to address things differently and, and approach things differently and so it, uh, it it's yeah and I, I don't think it's it's a bad thing I think it's it's a good thing but but if you're out there looking and, and you don't and you don't use the other tools then you know you've missed opportunities to to probably avoid having something happen before you would just go out there and find it yeah, I think the reputational damage thing is a, is a, is a big thing. And yeah, I think one of the things that's kind of become, at least I think that regulatory agencies have gotten more, <clears throat> say, aware of is, you know, I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, HDD was just considered a solution to everything. And that, uh, you know, you had something you didn't want to open, cut, you just drill it, no problem, you know, answer to everything. Well, you know, I think after some, fairly spectacular failures and, and, and upset landowners and, and regulatory agencies. I think, you know, it's, it's become a little more, you know, it seems like the regulatory agencies have started to figure out that, you know, there are risks with HDD, there are potential impacts with HDD and they can be significant. So, you know, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, the big thing with this, this guidance document is to make sure that you're doing your work ahead of time and you know with the monitoring i think the big thing there was the the documentation of it you know they want to see that someone's actually been doing it so um and the, and the other point you made rob about the uh you know sometimes you can have an inadvertent return thousand feet off center line or more you know and it, it's it, part of that's a function of the geology so you know the, the project team should kind of understand what that potential is and and you know and you can't prepare for every scenario that could happen, but at least know what the possibilities are ahead of time. Do you have a question? We have one? another question. Oh. Yay, David. Any BMP recommendations for managing an IR in the middle of a perennial stream that's not too deep? And then how about a river? I'm gonna to toss that to Amy, Joe, or, or <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> and there is a follow-up to that, so oh, get excited okay. too. So I have seen, um, I think it kind of depends on what's living in there and I'm not a biologist, so I can't specify what, what some measures would be. So I might have to defer to, to Amy maybe on that one as to what, um, what you would do if there's like a T&E species there. 
Um, I've seen sandbags used. Um, there's sometimes the, the having to weigh whether or not the IR is significant enough. Um, if it's going to cause more impact to go in and deal with it um, versus if it it's just going to dilute and everything's going to be fine. Um, so I've, I've seen some some people just say, well, if it, if it happens in, you know, this body of water, then we're just going to we're going to assess whether or not um, dealing with it is going to cause more impacts um, or if it's just the best course of action to let it kind of dilute itself. Um, there's also various um, sandbags I mentioned. Um, there's like a uh, can't remember the word, filter curtains, uh, tur turbid turbidity curtains, that's what I'm looking for, um, that, that can be used as well. So there's a couple of measures like that, uh, but there, there are probably additional things that have to be done if there's any sort of TNE &E species in there. Yeah, yeah, I would just add to that from a biological standpoint that it certainly depends on the quality and the location of that stream. If you're in a state that has um, significant, like up the Northeast, significant cold water fisheries or, um, very highly regulated streams, then you certainly are going to be on the phone with the agencies immediately. Um, obviously, stopping the flow of any material as soon as possible is first first thing to do. Um, but also, also, I mean, all of those perennial streams are going to be flowing. So like Andrea said, you're going to get, it's going to wash downstream and dilute pretty quickly. Um, and so the, the way you assess, I think, will be, and the way you clean up will be very much directed by the agency that you're reporting to. And what is, um, if there's a sensitive species or other ecosystem present in that stream. Would one possibility would be kind of just to sandbag the stream on either side of the source and then just do a pump around type of thing temporarily? You would want to be very careful doing that from a biological standpoint, depending on what's in that stream. You okay. might, if you've not, if you were say you had a species that a threatened or endangered species that was living in that stream and the reason you were drilling it was to avoid a take um, and now you have a take then that's going to be something that might like Andrea said might be exasperated by doing a, um, a pump around or, or anything like that um, so again you have to be at the direction of fish and wildlife immediately and, and any other reporting agency okay Joe anything I uh, know. Uh, I think Amy covered it. I, I don't really have anything else to add. Well, then maybe Joe, Amy, and Andrew, the, the follow-up to that is any success stories to managing said IRs without stopping the HDD and installing full stream bypasses, assuming a full stream bypass is even practical. Uh, you know, when, when that question was asked, I, I, I was trying to think if this has ever happened on one of my projects and I couldn't, I can't, I can't think of one. So honestly, I, I don't know how else you would deal with it um, other than to try to isolate the inadvertent return somehow, which would mean diverting the flow around it in some way. So a full stream bypass uh, or something like that, coffer dam, sandbag, something like that, assuming it was feasible and you could get it approved by all the agencies the only way I can think to, to deal with it. Yeah, I think you would have to adjust the drilling fluid properties probably. You might you might stop the pumping, um, see if everything hardens up and stops that IR on its own. I, I, I don't think there's any way that you could not at least pause the drilling process in order to make sure, you know, in order to try and see if you need to adjust the, the drilling fluid additives or just to wait and let everything cake up. Um, to kind of stop that. Uh, although I believe releases directly into a perennial into a perennial water body or into a, a water body in general are not super common. And I think it would be more common for it to kind of flow into the water body. Um, but yeah, that's 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 what I can contribute there. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. That's good. Do you, we have another one? Yeah. Um, John is asking if there's a fluid loss during a drill with no obvious surface IR. When does the fluid loss become a spill or a reportable event? Sorry to put you on the spot, Andrea. <laughs> so we toyed, we we did have a lot of internal discussion about this, and I think I have the guidance manual pulled up and with the, with the language that we used there. Um, you would not really need to report anything to us until you do have that IR, um, but we do have, in the HTD guidance, you should describe what you will do if there is a loss of drilling fluid circulation. So you should have measures in place where 
even before you see that IR where you are doing your monitoring and you're looking at all your, your various gauges and whatnot, and you're like, oh, something, something's not right in here, then there are measures that should be taken um, there. And the phrase we used is uh, response actions that, be, that could be taken in the event of significant or complete loss of drilling fluid circulation. Significant refers to any discernible loss of fluid circulation um, that could be an indicator of potential inadvertent return to the ground surface. Um, so we didn't really define what that what a significant event would be because we're not you know super familiar with it. It would be a kind of at the at the company's discretion, the contractor's discretion. Um, but if you have a situation where there is a discernible loss of circulation that could be an indicator of a potential inadvertent return, then you would have those measures in your HDD plan to, to deal with that. And that's what you would do, but you wouldn't necessarily report it to us until um, there is an IR. That, that, would, you would, that would all be documented obviously in your monitoring efforts. And then we would potentially request that documentation if a huge event occurs and we had to do some sort of forensic investigation. Um, but otherwise it, it wouldn't be something that you would need to report to us. <clears throat> Yeah, I know that in some cases, you know, uh, drilling fluid has got into people's wells as well. So that would be, I guess, another instance where you mean not necessarily a, an inadvertent return, but the, the drilling fluid is ending up where it doesn't belong and in, in impacting impacting others. So, um, any other you know, Mark, I, I would say to that point, uh, Andrea's answer there, you know, there are certain states that have their own requirements. Again, it's a state requirement, not a FERC requirement on that fluid loss and those thresholds in which it triggers you to do that notification. Um, a handful of states that I can think of, but, you know, one thing in the FERC guide is specifically speaking to FERC, you know, they lay out kind of three different scenarios, right? There's normal drilling conditions where you're, you're drilling, you're turning to the right, as Martin Charrington would say, and you've got full flow coming back to your drill rig. Um, then your step two is where you're actually experiencing a loss. It's good, but it's not coming to the surface. And then step three, Andrea, is either inadvertent return or a uh, full loss. I don't remember what you call it, but it's kind of that third. That's the bad. That's the bad one, right? Yeah, that, yeah it's just inadvertent return. So yeah, those are the three. Returns. Those are the three steps. So like in the reporting, I'd say like Pennsylvania specifically, and this may be good for everyone on the call to know, Pennsylvania DEP has a trenchless technology guidance document that was released on Saturday, what, two or three days ago, and it's out for a 60 day public comment. So go put your comments in. Um, you've got 60 days or you've got 57 days. Um, they do kind of get into more specifics on reporting of when you have a loss, not necessarily an interval return. Water wells are a big thing in that state as well. I can think over in Ohio, they have a requirement and it's more of a percentage loss of your volume over a certain time period, like over a 24 hour time period, if you lose 50% or whatever, I don't remember the exact numbers, but that was an interesting approach as well. So I just uh, say the, the, the states are becoming a little bit more um, interested in those details. So everybody look out for that, depending on the state in which you're operating. Uh, Webb, I want to uh, give my appreciation to you for sending me that um, uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, um, uh, 75 pages of, uh, of how to do it out there. And uh, I, it's, I'd rather have my eyeballs peeled than have to read this whole thing, but I'm going to read it <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yeah, they got you. Uh, that it's it's that that report is you'll never do another job uh, in that area as far as I can see as far <laughs> as the state goes right there. Uh, but that's true. And it's, Mark, it, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> did you ever when you invented HDD in the 1970s? Did you ever did you ever see that? Uh, what were your thoughts on inadvertent? I got a question. What were your thoughts on inadvertent returns in the 1970s or well, 80s? We kinda, well, <laughs> that's a funny question. Uh, not funny, but but uh, answer to answer the question, uh, we we looked for we wanted to have frack outs and 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 uh, because what do you do with the drilling mud? You know, so it, it was a, it was in an era when. Um, 
the rivers are pretty dirty anyway, and you couldn't see, you know, you could see big chains of oil coming down the river and dead fish upside down. And so, you know, dealing with the drilling mud was a problem. So getting rid of it or just purpose, just letting it, just letting it, you know, we didn't want returns back. We wanted to get rid of that drilling mud. So that was the beginning, but that, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to, uh, that doesn't seem to matter. Uh, that, that issue doesn't seem to be a problem today. I mean, of, uh, uh, you, you need to get those returns back and, and, uh, uh, and clean them up because it's a costly item out there. But anyway, that, that's, the hist that's the early, early history. Uh, uh, so Martin, you you did the first HTD. That was 1971. Is that the? Uh, that actually, uh, yeah. No, no, actually, the start the first very first one started in 1970, and by the time we got done, it was 1971. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there there was a few fractures in that. I have to, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, yeah well thanks thanks uh thanks martin for your input there uh yeah it's interesting to see how the industry has changed and you know in some ways it's the same but in other ways a lot of things have changed and the expectations have changed and you know a lot of contractors uh capability has really increased quite a bit as well so it's kind of interesting to see how the things have evolved over time um we so probably still have a ways to go right i mean i think a lot of these practices that FERC lays out helps us with our execution but you know if we can continue with the innovative ideas and getting better right and continuing to get better continuing to come up with better practices you know whether it's yeah. hdd i think about direct pipe right people talked about direct pipe i think there are other ways to execute trenchless crossings that could um, help us be more successful and uh and help us uh, operate in a more environmentally responsible manner as well so in understanding getting a better understanding of when maybe a trenchless installation is is not the right solution you know um i think i think that's important go ahead Ralph. Yeah, i think that's really important mark that you made that comment earlier that years ago the trenchless was the the magic solution to everything and if you, if you didn't want to mess with it you drilled it and it probably wasn't the best solution in a lot of those situations and created issues that you know, maybe there wasn't a good design, there wasn't a good way to approach it, created some issues, and, and that created some problems for the industry in general as well. But then it seems to have taken a, maybe not a 180, but certainly a, a big change in the other direction to where trenchless is, is oftentimes viewed in a very poor light. So hopefully there's some middle ground that we can all come to and find the right right applications for, for trenchless solutions and execute them well, and, and it will be a, a good good solution for, for everyone. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, any questions? Last questions? Um, wrap this thing up or? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, one thing that I think would be great is if everyone on the panel, if you could think of one piece of insight that you, you want. I mean, we have almost 100 folks on the phone right now. Based on everything that Mark has guided you through today, what would that be that you'd like to just share with this audience? Like, hey, this is a lessons learned, or hey, this is a tip I always try to incorporate on my projects. So not to put you on the spot, but we're gonna do it. Here we are. Um, let's start with, Rob, you're off mute, so. I, I was gonna jump right in and, and take it for everyone there, so. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I think what, I would, what I would like to say, and we talked about it quite a bit as we were discussing, preparing for this, is the communication aspects of the, you have the engineering community, the owner community, the contractor community, and sometimes there's not very good or easy pathways for, for those three to come together and then to work with the agencies as well. But anytime that we can do that, where, where we can have all those, all those uh, entities working together and developing projects, feasibility, design, construction, all that, when we can all, all work together and, and we don't sort of get pigeonholed by various different things because maybe engineering wasn't involved when, when the route was permitted and contractors weren't involved until the very end or, or, or some combination thereof to where you can get the right people at the right table at, at the right stage of the project so that you can you can develop the best solution for a particular application or a particular location. 
That's awesome. How about you, Joe? Um, it's probably obvious, but I would just say, you know, proper planning uh, is the best way to uh, avoid a lot of these issues. Understanding that HDDs are such a critical component to any project that, that involves one. Uh, understanding what, what you're going to be required to do, provide the agencies, and then, you know, prioritizing uh, acquiring that information and filing it in a clear way, uh, I think will save you a lot of trouble in the long run. That's great. Web? Yeah, I think I think just um, picking the right tool in the toolbox for the feature, right? I think sometimes our industry gets, you know, their favorite construction method and they use HDD when it's not, maybe not the right method like Rob mentioned. And, and I think back to like Martin on the phone when he started the first one in 1970 and finished it in 1971, that full year it took, I, you know, there was a lot of innovation that went into that to do a trenchless method to cross a river that had not been done before. And I think if we, as, if we as an industry can continue to evolve and look at the challenges that we have and come up with innovative ways to cross these features like direct pipe and don't just use your preconceived method, do an alternatives analysis. And then maybe if the industry can help us and come up with ways to help reduce these instances, I think we can all get better. Love that. And then Amy, I'm going to go to you and then Andrea. And then we actually have one last quick question that they're hoping to answer. And then I'll, I'll end with Mark on some insights. So Amy. Um, I would just say, make sure that, you know, you've got a team of, of uh, experts on all this and it's not um, HDD crossing. This is not just engineering that you've got environmental aspects that you need to consider. Um, so engage your consultants or your environmental team and make sure that they're in a part of this planning process. One of the things we do is we're keeping track of the FERC docket and knowing what's being asked on various projects. And we have our hands in a lot of different, a lot of different companies, and we might have some insights that of how the industry is approaching things that may not have been considered and trends that are going on. So be sure to um, keep all the players of the team engaged in these decisions early on. Awesome, Andrea. Yeah, so I would kind of echo that by saying that um, understanding that eLibrary is not the most user friendly database. Um, there is a lot of good publicly available information on there. Um, so I would say look at final approved versions of HDD plants from other companies, other projects. Um, and that can be a, a good place to start if you have not developed an HDD plan for us in a while, because if you're gonna try to reuse a plan that was approved by us in 2017, that's probably not gonna cut it anymore. Um, I would recommend completing all the geotechnical investigations as early as possible. Um, make sure that the depth of those borings exceed the depth of the alignment um, and make sure that when you file the geotechnical information, we do read those reports so make any recommendations or concerns that are identified by your geotechnical contractor are addressed. Um, and just keep in mind that we are not geotechnical engineers, we are not, uh, you know, drillers. Um, but we are reasonable. Um, what we're really looking for always is defensibility and justification. So those are kind of the most important things when you're trying to pitch this, this stuff to us and how you're going to um, make this crossing happen or what mitigation you're going to be using. It just needs to, to be defensible and justified. So things that I would, I would keep in mind. No, that's awesome, Andrea. Thank you. Um, this is a longer question I put it in the chat for a panelist if you need to read it along while I, I read it out loud really quickly and I, I will um, try to answer it quickly and then go on to Mark and then I'll close this off but assuming that IR only contains approved additives or none and assuming on TNE pre pre per pre-construction surveys and it's not during fish spawning season there's no cold water habitat you're good this is great and assuming there's a very high percentage of ground surface water content in the IR but a high a very high volume of the surface groundwater diluted drilling mud is expected any successful BMP recommendations for treating the IR on site in a manner that enables the collected IR slash water to be reintroduced downstream into the water body aka avoiding containment and disposal of everything Whoa, I love that. And if you need me to redo it, I won't, but it's in the chat. I think kind of what I was talking about is, you know, because if you if you have a crack out or an inadvertent turn into, let's say a shallow water body, let's say a, like a, a wetland or something, you go to clean that up, that drilling fluid is going to have be diluted by that, that surface water. 
So the volume that you then have to deal with is a much larger than just the amount of drilling fluid that surface. Could be 10 times that. So I think they're asking, is there, are there treatment methodologies, I think, or are there treatment methodologies that can be used to treat the, the, the collected material on site to then later kind of separate the water from the drilling fluid and then discharge the water back into the environment. It's kind of where I take it. I Any other comments? take a stab at this. Um, I would say, and Andrea, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say in this situation for, again, it's gonna be somewhat state dependent, but you're gonna have state water quality discharge um, limitations that you're gonna have to make sure you comply with. I know that there are some like on-site filtration and, and clean up um, procedures and, and technology out there that can be done and then it can be discharged. But the other thing you keep in mind is whether or not you permitted discharging water directly into a water body. And if you didn't, then that would be a variance with FERC as well as getting the appropriate permits from your agencies. Um, alternatively, it is potentially, um, I would say, Andrea, maybe a notification or mention in the monthly report that if you have approval to discharge to the ground um, in vegetated areas within your workspace or just outside, then you could potentially do that. That's my first pass and I hopefully I didn't say anything incorrect, but that's kind of what I would be the guidance I would provide and certainly talking to FERC about it. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I, I don't have anything as far as methods. I think that would be more of a, a contractor thing that if they, if they would know how exactly to do that, but in terms of the yeah, permitting and and how to handle that from, from our side. Yeah, I would agree with Amy. Awesome. Well, thank you for all the great questions. And Mark, um, your turn. Insights, you have 25 years of experience. You've heard all these wonderful things that our panelists has, have shared. Anything that um, you'd like to share to keep in mind or tips or lessons learned? Well, I think a lot of it's been covered. I mean, I think the nice thing with the guidance is that, you know, FERC has stated in there that they want the feasibility of a particular crossing, be it direct pipe or HE, to be evaluated. And so I think that's, you know, I think that's something that wasn't done in the past. You know, it was just, I think every HDD was just considered feasible. And we've kind of talked about that a little bit. So I like the fact that, you know, they're wanting to people, wanting people to take a harder look at what are the risks associated if we do have problems with this crossing, what are the potential impacts and, and actually factoring that into making a decision on the type of construction methodology. So, you know, I, you know, I like that, you know, there's kind of more thought put into it, but, you know, when you are looking at it, you need, someone needs to look at it who understands drilling, who, under, who understands the potential risks that the subsurface conditions provide. You know, the geology across the country around the world is all different. Different geologies have different risks associated with them. And so having people looking at the feasibility with the subsurface conditions in, in mind and, and how those impact the construction risk and potential impacts, I think is very important. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I got. Love it. Well, uh, on behalf of GEO, thank you so much, Andrea, Amy, Rob, Joe and Webb and Mark for moderating. Uh, we really appreciate you. We know this takes time and appreciate all the prep to do this. Um, thank you to everyone that attended today. We love these webinars. They're really fun because we get to connect with people um, and we get Martin. I mean, hello, that's amazing. Second, second time. Second time. I, it's promise. amazing. So we really appreciate um, all you guys are doing in the industry and definitely reach out to us if you have ideas on future webinars. Um, or if you have additional questions that we can relay to the presenters. So with that, we are gonna commit to ending before that 1.5 hour, we have six minutes to spare, but thank you for being here today. Thanks, yeah, and I'll send out an email soon with the recording and the certificate. So take care, everyone. Thank you, see y'all later. Thanks.